I'm a believer in the proverb, necessity is the mother of invention. And this video is one that celebrates the achievements of one ancient civilization that figured things out way ahead of its time. And what was that necessity? It couldn't be any simpler. Survival. Some historians call it the first Arab kingdom. From the 4th century BCE to the 2nd century BCE, the Nabataean kingdom was a booming, advanced, and powerful civilization along what was known as the incense trade route. They were renowned for being exceptional tradesmen and monopolizing the trade industry of frankincense, myrrh, and spices in the region. We also know that they spoke an old, now extinct language form that was a mix of Arabic and Aramaic, called Nabataean Aramaic. We're also able to recognize the extents of their kingdom from their carved architecture and symbolic engravings in towns and cities around modern southern Syria, all the way south to territories in northern Saudi Arabia. Some of the kingdom's major cities included Rakemu, Hawara, al hijr and Dummat al jandal that ranged in population size from 20,000 people as a maximum to 5,000 people at a minimum. But the Nabataeans were a secretive society. Not much is known about their archaeological history except what marvelous architectural features they left with us. Other than that, we have loads of pottery, yet an undescribably small number of written records from them. Notably though, the thing we know most about them, and maybe the most important, is their ingenuity and perseverance for survival in the most challenging of earthly habitats. If you walk through the Nabataean capital city, Rakemu, better known today as Petra, you will most likely admire the many architectural masterpieces around you. It's not such a long and stretched out city, one that was once only inhabited by 20,000 Nabataeans. And so you're quickly exposed to easily recognizable majestic buildings such as Al-Khazna, the treasury, and its immaculate carvings into the mountain. Then followed by the Grand Theater, again seemingly cut with ease into the hillside. Such a landmark would seat in excess of 8,500 persons for the listening and viewings of various spectacles. And finally, to the complex of pools that seemed a little bit out of place in such a harsh and arid environment. Who would waste waters on pool and baths within such a habitat? Well, the Nabataeans did, and they did it with class. You see, as much as the Nabataeans had to contend with the desert climate encircling them, they were able to transcend such difficulty. As with the ancient builders of the pyramids, for their time, the Nabataeans performed miracles when it came to construction. Further embodied by their architectural creativity in the management and sustenance of the most important resource for human existence, water. The Nabataean kingdom was located in an area that receives approximately 100 millimeters of annual rainfall. This would rank the kingdom in 175th place in terms of today's rankings for countries by average annual precipitation. Of course, they had some added assurances to the various out-of-city springs available to them, but all in all, the Nabataeans had to resort to high-level engineering to be able to sustain themselves on an H2O level. And they managed to achieve just that and even beyond, through the use of unparalleled ingenuity for their time, a supply of 48 million liters of water per day, meaning a usage per capita of 2,400 liters a day per person, was achieved. Now compare that with today's water use by modern nations like China at 1,176 liters a day, the United Kingdom at 351 liters a day, and Germany at 850 liters per day. And what's more amazing is that beyond the water supply I just mentioned, the Nabataeans also had to allow for the excess supply of water required by the large trading caravans that would regularly stop in the city. And one last element they didn't forget to accommodate for was the supply of water for any surprise droughts that might have taken place during their time. So how did the Nabataeans manage to achieve such amazing results? First of all, any strategy the Nabataeans had in combating the environment of the desert had to be centrally controlled, meaning they had to have some sort of water supply and distribution department within their hierarchic structure. Not only that, each city and town had to apply its own version of a hydraulic system respective of their specific habitat. What was applicable engineering-wise in Petra wouldn't necessarily be applicable in al hijr or Dummat al jandal Don't forget to join the Chronicles by subscribing to the channel. And like it if you do actually like it. And by clicking the notification button, you'll be up to date on all new releases.
Then about the system for the supply of water was broken down into three main components, collection, storage, and distribution. For collection, there were two main sources, rain and springs. Rain was extremely limited, so any single event had to be maximized by squeezing every single drop of water into the Nabatayan system. And this is where the dam system found in Petra starts to make sense. What appears to be a random series of walls built throughout the upper levels of the terrain were actually specifically targeting the catchment of rainfall. These dams would channel rain away from the cliffs and into the water storage solutions. Springs both in and out of the city were the second source of water for the Nabataeans. The external large springs further outside the city limits, although complementary to the main source of water rain, were the ones mainly used since rainfall was kept as the last resort for use. Internal springs were also utilized minimally as supplemental contingency sources. For storage, there were two main components to the Nabataean systems, tanks and cisterns. Tanks were virtually extremely large pools of water that would more often than not be carved out of the hillside and away from direct sunlight, or were hidden under cover of large man-made slabs of rock. Cisterns, a variation of the tank, were a highly efficient storage system, as they had a network of direct openings on the ground surface where rainwater and spring water flowed down from the rock surfaces and were collected. One significant element of the storage system involved the use of linked basins that would assist in the filtration of the water to remove unnecessary sediment and silt, consequently making the water more potable for the population. Finally, we come to distribution. The Nabataeans, in utilizing all the water supply resources available to them, invested heavily in implementing main subterranean supply pipelines linking the various main springs from outside the city and into the urban core of the city. These pipelines were intentionally hidden as a defense strategy. No one was able to limit the supply of water to Petra. Such a strategy would serve the Nabataeans well in having never been successfully invaded or to have surrendered under siege. One of the Nabataeans' main ethos was that there was no room to waste a single drop of water. Terracotta pipelines were employed with the highest efficacy to avoid two main conditions for the loss of water. First, evaporation. And second, the overflow of water due to the many sharp bends and curves of the water distribution system. And it is through the distribution system that we discover how highly advanced Nabataean engineering was. And we see it through the use of pipeline systems requiring the analysis and processing of empirical knowledge of fluid mechanics. Predating Western science's official discovery of similar principles some two millennia later. And to give you a flavor of how elaborate such a system was, here is an aerial photo of Petra that includes the vast array of engineering solutions that were necessary and what are being highlighted are the various elements that shaped such a complex water supply system. The main pipelines coming from outside the city, the dams, the large storage tanks and cisterns, the basins, the internal springs, and the internal network of minor pipelines. Not only were the Nabataeans masters of water management, but also excelled in the implementing of agricultural systems that maximized the efficiencies of their water supply while creating effective methods to improve the conditions of their limited fertile grounds. These techniques allowed for the protection of their soil's richness throughout the seasons, subsequently expanding their ability to grow a wide array of crops along the year. One of the major differences between the engineering wonders of the ancient Egyptian world when compared to that of the Nabataeans is that the Egyptians' work was on a massive scale and representative of a brute force in the virtual moving of mountains, dwarfing everything in its vicinity. Nabataean design was significantly less in your face. It was not only more in line with human scale, but beyond that was hidden away to camouflage it from potential enemies. And what is mind-blowing and further sets the Nabataean ingenuity apart is that the hydraulic systems that were designed and implemented over two millennia ago are still in use today, still providing life and survival to those living in the area, even after modernity has made its mark on hydraulic and fluid mechanics. And that's what I call timeless design.